Hello, I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, your guide through the ARRL license manuals. The videos in this course follow the manuals section for section. You can get the ARRL license manuals from the source listed below the video. After you watch the video, dig into the corresponding section of the book, study the associated questions, and then come back for the next video. Lots has changed over the past few years regarding public thinking about RF exposure. So instead of the material that uh, I had in place for RF safety for the technician before, I'm going to up the ante here a little bit so I can address the issues in uh, 9.4 uh, on RF exposure rather more directly. And the video that you will see, although made about six years ago, uh, is much more current and matches what's in the book. There's a great deal of misinformation floating around on the internet pertinent to this topic. So I'm going to give you some background information that underlies everything in this section. When some people hear the word radiation, they think immediately of radiation in the sense of a nuclear bomb, which is very dangerous radiation indeed. But that's only one type of radiation. In general, radiation means emitting energy in a radial pattern, meaning from some central point. We use the term in everyday life to describe radiators that provide heat, even for the device in our car that cools the engine. In a heating device, we speak of the radiant element. In every case, some kind of energy comes out of the radiator measurable energy, I might add. Note the similarity between the word radiate and the word radio. All radio antennas both emit and absorb radiant energy at radio frequencies. Okay, now bear with me as I go into a bit of technical detail. This is more depth than is in the book, but it can really help you understand the difference between ionizing and non-ionizing radiation. Let's start by looking at an atom. We'll use an oxygen atom, but it could be most anything. I'm going to simplify things here. An ordinary oxygen atom has eight protons and seven neutrons in the nucleus. We don't care about these. What we care about are the eight electrons. Two of the electrons are in the inner shell, I'm simplifying here, and there are six electrons in the outer shell. Now, I'm going to jump to a concept that you may remember from your high school physics class. We recall that electromagnetic waves can sometimes be thought of as a stream of particles called photons. Is energy a wave or is it a particle? The answer is that it's both, and which one we look at depends on what we're interested in. In this case, it's the photon. Now, watch, because here's where the magic is. The oxygen's electrons are photon absorbers, but only certain photons, because quantum theory tells us that these electrons can assume only certain energy levels. A photon strikes an electron and raises its energy level. This has a tendency to move the electron further from the nucleus. After a while, the electron gets tired of having this extra energy and emits a photon and goes back to the lower energy state. However, if a particularly energetic photon hits an electron, it pushes the electron so far away that it loses contact with its mother nucleus. This creates a free electron and an ionized oxygen atom. Photons that can do this are called ionizing radiation. Now, note this carefully. The energy of a photon is directly proportional to the associated wave frequency. So a photon on the 80 meter band has much less energy than one on the 10 meter band. And photons of light have way, way more energy than those of radio waves. And get this, 
To have enough energy to ionize an atom, the photon has to be in the ultraviolet band or higher. By the way, this is how the ionosphere is ionized. Okay, that's the long way around the barn. Anyway, the bottom line is that photons at ham radio frequencies simply do not have enough energy to ionize the atoms in our body. Ham radio RF energy is non-ionizing. But now go back to our oxygen atom. RF energy can push those electrons further from the nucleus. How much it pushes them out is measured as the temperature. Usually we measure temperature of matter at an aggregate collection of atoms. With all those energetic electrons, atoms start bouncing off each other at a higher rate. This well done diagram from Wikipedia shows air composed mostly of nitrogen and to a lesser degree oxygen. As the temperature goes up, the atoms bounce off each other at a higher rate. Well, that's fine for gas, but what happens inside human tissue? This diagram, also from Wikipedia, shows that molecules will vibrate, sometimes quite a bit. A molecule that vibrates more is hotter. Now the molecules in our body are wiggling around all the time. The body keeps the temperature the same, so we always have about the same level of vibration, which is normal for healthy tissue. So where's the issue here? The issue comes when there is too much energy and the vibration level is too high, causing the molecules to break apart. We have a name for this process, and we use it all the time. By raising the temperature of our food, we cause the molecules to break apart into simpler molecules that are easier to digest. We call this cooking. Well, now you know how a microwave oven works. You put uncooked food in the microwave. The energy in the microwave is actually aimed at the oxygen atoms and it heats them, meaning pushing those electrons around, to the point where the molecules break down. If you don't want to cook, but merely heat something up, you put it in the microwave for less time. We can learn from this example. The damage that could occur to us from radio waves is heating and cooking. As you saw in the microwave example, it can take copious quantities of heat to do the cooking. The amount of damage, well, <laughs> I guess we can call it cooking rather than damage, is proportional to the amount of time spent receiving the radiation. This, then, is the danger from RF radiation. It causes heating in our bodies. In most cases, the heating is so tiny that we don't notice. We can get far more heating simply by standing under the summer sun. Okay, we've identified some factors here. One, the rate of delivery of RF energy measured in watts per unit area, or in our case, milliwatts per square centimeter. Square centimeter is about that big. Two, the duration of exposure. Now, I'm going to add a third. Not all of the RF energy is absorbed. In fact, just like an antenna, some of the energy is reflected. And let's add our final factor, frequency or wavelength. Just like an antenna that likes to absorb energy at its resonant frequency, the body behaves the same, being more sensitive to some frequencies than others. This paragraph from the book on page 8-8 about the body's specific absorption rate is most interesting. It points out that various parts of our body respond to various frequencies. Recall that the wavelength is inversely proportional to frequency, so smaller parts of our bodies absorb higher frequencies. The answer to the question of how much heating is too much is exceptionally controversial. Some would say that any heating is too much. That, of course, is an impossible limit. The sun itself emits radiation at all frequencies, both ionizing and non-ionizing. In fact, too much exposure to sunlight can cause sunburn in the short term, that's the non-ionizing, and cancer in the long term, that's the ionizing uh, ultraviolet and up. 
In all this soup of radiation at all frequencies, our ham radio RF radiation in the big scheme of things is remarkably small. A few years ago, the FCC, in response to the controversy, created regulations that lay out the maximum permissible exposure, or MPE, which are shown in figure 8.9. The dip corresponds to the sensitivity of the human body to radiation. Note there's a big dip right in the HF ham radio frequencies. Okay, so how do we get from the diagram to actually determining our exposure? Let's go back to the microwave. On the microwave, you can set the power level. The microwave sets the power level by the ratio of the time it's on to the time it's off. In other words, it's varying the duty cycle. The amount of heating is equal to the average measured over a period of time. Okay, let's get back to the book where it talks about duty cycle. The term duty cycle has military origins. A soldier is on duty for a certain time and then off duty for a certain time. The duty cycle is the percentage the soldier is on duty compared to the total time. For example, a soldier that is on duty eight hours in a 24-hour day is on duty one-third of the time. We can say that his or her duty cycle is 33 percent. So if we radiate at 100 watts, but the transmitter is on for only one out of every four minutes, we say that the duty cycle is 25 percent. Another way of saying this is that the average power emitted by the transmitter is 25 watts. The duty cycle varies substantially with different modes and is often much less than you might expect. For example, single sideband. Your 100 watt transmitter emits 100 watts only on voice peaks. The average power is much less. Then you have to take into account that in a conversation, you're only using your transmitter half the time. Table 8-4 lists typical duty cycles for various modes. The book does a good job describing controlled environments, meaning people in the environment know about the hazard and take ordinary precautions, and uncontrolled environments where people exposed have no idea they're being exposed. Let's go through several examples. The book mentions an ARRL website with many documents that describe RF exposure limits in great detail. It lists an online calculator, which can be found at hintlink.com slash power underscore density dot htm. Let's take a look at an average HF 100 watt station using single sideband on 10 meters or 28 megahertz. So we'll fill in our single sideband duty cycle of 20 percent. So our average power is 20 watts but only when transmitting. We have to remember that we receive also so we're transmitting only 50 percent of the time for an average power of 10 watts. That's what we'll use. Let's use a dipole which has a gain of 2.2 dBi over the theoretical isotropic radiator. Oh, and let's say we're standing 10 feet away from the antenna, which could mean standing directly under it. We see the result, which is very safe. In fact, we could get much closer to the antenna. Now let's stay at that frequency, but we're going to get a 1500 watt linear amplifier. For single sideband, that gives us an average power of 150 watts. And we'll put up a Yegi beam antenna with 10 dB of gain over a dipole. Now let's look again. The antenna gain is actually 12.2 dB compared to the isotropic antenna. We'll put in our 10 feet. Are we safe? No. In fact, the minimum distance from the beam is almost 50 feet in the direction the beam is pointed. If your neighbor is in that direction, you may want to reduce power or else get the antenna up high enough that it radiates over the top of your neighbor's house. Let's do a radical example. 
Let's go back to the 1500 watt station with the big beam. And let's have our operator send out a RIDI bulletin that lasts quite a while. So the average power is in fact the peak power, or 1500 watts. Let's recompute. The minimum distance to an uncontrolled environment is over 150 feet. If your neighbors are inside this radius, you need to mitigate the RF exposure problem. All these examples have been at 10 meters. Now 1500 watts is overkill on 10 meters. Even when the band is open, it's quiet, so solid contacts can be made easily. Let's try a more realistic scenario on 20 meters, or 14 megahertz. We'll keep our 1500 watt station with 100% duty cycle and a 10 dBD beam. Note that the minimum distance for an uncontrolled environment is around 80 feet. But let's go back to a more realistic single sideband with speech processing with a 50% duty cycle. Our power drops to 20% of 1500 watts or 300 watts. This is quite a common scenario, but note that the distance is still 35 feet. More complete modeling of the scenario I just described would include the height of the antenna compared to where the people would be in the uncontrolled environment. Height will also give you a better receive signal strength too. Height matters. Several mitigation methods are described in the book, which include moving the antenna up and avoiding pointing at places where people can be. I'll note here that the suggestion of using a handheld with an external microphone is certainly feasible, but rarely done. But let's take another look at that handheld. It's putting out 5 watts at 100% duty cycle when you're transmitting. Let's give it a 50% duty cycle. The antenna is actually less effective than an isotropic radiator, but let's assume it's the same. So we enter 2.5 watts, an antenna gain of 0 dB, and 144 megahertz. As the control operator, you're in a controlled environment, so you should have the transmit antenna about 10 inches away from your body. 10 inches? And for uncontrolled, you need it close to 2 feet away. And where is that radiation going? Uh, your head? Maybe you ought to rethink that handheld mic. How about a mobile installation with the antenna on the roof? You're pretty well shielded inside your car, but what about others? We'll go for 50 watts, typical for a VHF mobile station, and 50% duty cycle. If you're not net control, your duty cycle may be considerably lower, but if you're net control, the 50% number is probably pretty good. And the antenna can have gain. Let's go for a 5 8 radiator with about 3 dB gain over a dipole, or 5.2 dB gain over an isotropic radiator. So let's do the calculation, again at 2 meters. Hmm, the uncontrolled distance is 10 feet. So if you're using your mobile antenna at a special event, people should stay at least 10 feet away from your antenna. Something to think about. Well, that's a lot more information than in the book, but I want you to understand how all this works. This video should not be considered a complete safety briefing on RF exposure. Thanks for following along with the videos and the book. After you've studied this section in the manual and are satisfied you understand the questions and their answers, come back here for the next video. The ARRL is the National Association for Amateur Radio, and I urge you to join, even if you don't have your license yet. That way you get QST, the League's monthly magazine full of articles for beginners and veterans alike, or you can choose On the Air, a magazine designed specifically for those new to amateur radio. Until we next meet, 73.